Welcome to another episode of Scientology Fair Game, the podcast. <laughs> I thought I'd mix it up. Hi, Mikey. Hi, Lily. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. Excellent. The weather has changed here in Southern California. Has it really? Yes. It is all of a sudden fall in a well, that's California nice. sort of way. Well, that's <laughs> nice. Well, Amy and I, oh, I, we haven't even introduced Amy and I'm already yes, talking please. about it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so we have the original OG from yes. the aftermath today. Mm-hmm. Yes. Amy Scobie, our dear friend and wonderful person, Amy. But I was just going to say, I know you're about to say something, Leah, but I wanted to jump in because weather is really important. Here in Florida, where Amy and I live, it has gotten down to 73 degrees at night. It's still 88 (laughs) during the day, but it has gotten down to 73 at night, which is very pleasant for Florida. Just letting you know. Yes. Yes. (laughs) That is chilly weather there. That is chilly. You got everybody's, the fireplaces Everybody's going. wrapped up in their scarves. And, you do you know, guys even have fireplaces in your houses? I have a fireplace in my you house. Do? Do you do? Yeah, do we you use it do? like twice a year. Yeah. Maybe three times. The weather is probably similar here today, but yet I am freezing. I am literally sitting here freezing. I'm, I'm thinking about putting my heater on. <laughs> oh, my God. Come to Florida. <laughs> no, thank you. Hey, not not because I don't like Florida. It's just I was going to ask you, Amy. Yeah. How does it feel to be back there? Because, you know, Florida, uh, you know, that area just has bad. I just have bad memories. You know, I should probably go to Florida and have a good time so that I could change my memories of Florida. But how does it feel for you? Because you guys are close to, to Scientology where you guys are. Very. I'm about an hour away. Oh, that's not bad. That's far enough. Yeah, it is. And, you know, and it's not until you get like almost on 210 South Fort Harrison <laughs> that you start feeling the creeps, you know, because they, they really don't stretch out very Isn't far. that funny? I was going to say that, that an hour away from Flag, that's in Clearwater, that's the, the hub of Scientology, the Mecca. Well, we don't call it Mecca anymore. Uh, they, they, they rightfully changed the name, but... Um, it's what would you call it? Like the what would you re- rename it's it? It's the like? spiritual headquarters. That's what they call it. Perfect. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you don't find many Scientologists living outside of uh, walking distance to Scientology or within a five to ten minute drive from Flag because it's it's just not done. I mean, an hour away, you could read a book, go on the internet, watch a television show. <laughs> yep. In fact, Leah, you know when Christy moved here because her family was here after she left the Sea Org, they made her live an hour away from Flag. She was not allowed to live, even though she had routed out of the Sea Org. And still considered a Scientologist, still considered a Scientologist, just not... Yeah, her mother-in-law was the ED of Tampa Org. I mean, it was crazy. They would not allow her to live within an hour of flag. Why was that? To keep the bad, you know, why away from the all the great mighty things And Amy knows Clearwater. this. Amy knows this to be true. When people leave the Sea Organization, not Scientology, so the Sea Org is the, the, the paramilitary section of Scientology where they live communally, where they sign billionaire contracts, There's a difference between the Sea Org and a a civilian Scientologist. When you leave the Sea Org, um, it is considered um, unbecoming, you know, so they don't want parishioners really to see Sea Org members being civilian Scientologists, so they ship them off. Oftentimes, I knew a Sea Org member my whole life, and I was like, hey, where's such and such? Oh, they're on a mission. Or they're <laughs> yeah. on a, they're at another Scientology organization. When in truth, they left the Sea Org like ten years earlier. Right. I had to sign something when I was on my route out procedure that I would pay ten million dollars if I came back into the city of Clearwater. <laughs> of course. Are you serious? <laughs> I'm totally serious. I'm totally. Serious. That is amazing. Yeah, and um, we actually moved to Clearwater Beach shortly after that. <laughs> <laughs> 
a few years later. Did they try to collect the ten million, Amy, that you have sitting oh, no. in your account? Oh, okay. No, no, no. Yeah. They, you know, they're going to try all kinds of different things to intimidate people on the way out to, you know, try to keep some sort of control, but didn't didn't work. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, Amy, you were um, a pretty big executive in in Scientology Sea Org. Like, if you'd like to, or uh, Amy, why don't you explain who you were um, in the Sea Organization? Okay, well, I rose to the ranks of the Watchdog Committee, and basically, I was on um, uh, personnel. I was in charge of personnel until I was assigned a project that Shelley Miscavige ran to man up Tom Cruise's household with Scientologists so that he was fully surrounded by Scientologists. And what was told to you, Amy, about this project? Why would why would David Miscavige and Shelley Miscavige be concerned with Tom Cruise? And was, by the way, was Tom Cruise aware of this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He was, okay. you know, they were approving the people that we were submitting for their review and authorization. Was Tom of the mind of why would I have non-Scientologists around me destroying my life? It was really, I mean, it was a twofold purpose. One, to surround them by Scientologists so that that's what they're, they have every single aspect of their life has Scientology in it, number one. And number two, we're their resources to be able to rat them out if anything is going on in their life and always know and keep tabs on what's going on in that celebrity's life. So just in case, like if Tom started to date somebody who wasn't a Scientologist, that person might have influence on him reading something not, you know, true about Scientology or or possibly leaving or or, you know, Yes, leaving the organization. Or if he said anything bad about the organization or David Miscavige, God forbid. They wanted to know, right. They wanted to know right away. And in fact, I know people who were routinely put in for interrogation to find out what was being, what, what was going on in the household and what was being said. So that's a, a, you know, a line that was very important was to not only have them always surrounded by Scientologists to keep them in the fold, but also to have a report line back to the church. And what kind of reports were getting back to Dave Miscavige about Tom Cruise? What, what would be so alarming that would be sent to, to Dave Miscavige? Uh, I mean, I remember a couple things. One was um, what was going on between Nicole and her father, who wasn't very keen on Scientology. And, and that was being reported? Yes. So sure. you'd be in the household and Nicole would be talking about her dad or with her dad or her dad would be talking with her and uh, that was being said in front of Tom about maybe the organization not being what it what it says it is or... Yeah, and also just every single um, course room and auditing room, you know, all of the facilities like at Celebrity Center were also equipped with cameras and microphones so that to catch anything that was going on and uh, and you know being said within their sessions and so on, so that that would go and it wouldn't just go to their their case supervisor or, you know or something like that. It would go all the way up. <laughs> I mean, I was for eleven years. I was responsible for the Celebrity Center Network, so I saw and heard a lot of this stuff, you know. And um, it was there were some things that were complete total flaps. That uh, you want to explain what a flap is? A flap is. Well, like a 10 alarm fire or something that Scientology would consider, you know, of like what? Well, like, I mean, I think people are really interested to know how invasive uh, Scientology is, not just on just in celebrities lives. Mm -hmm. But this is routine in Scientology, but to actually infiltrate a celebrity's private life to then report to their church. It's pretty insidious, Mike, wouldn't you say? I would say that. Yes, I <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we take this for granted because we know this, but our listeners right. don't know this. We've never touched on the subject and we've never had somebody on the inside. I, I don't think pe people have ever heard this. So what kind of things, what, what were the things that were going on that would be reported and acted upon by Scientology? Okay. So, for example, one specific celebrity, their um, auditing sessions were being listened in on. David Miscavige... Um, was getting these reports and he called an executive that I was in their office, Mark Yeager, and said, oh my God, can you believe what this person is doing? They're, you know, giving on the phone with this person while giving a blowjob to this person. They're married to that one. And, you know, like this kind of thing. And they're all 
giddy about it and laughing about it and like this is disgusting that this is you know so you're saying a celebrity was in their their private confidential session and it was being list and they were giving up their transgressions right that's right they're giving up their sins and it's being listened in on by david miscavige and he's calling other employees of the sea org of scientology the top echelon the executive strata of Scientology. By the way, Mark Yeager, too, has not been seen in public for God knows how many years. But anyway, he's calling and he's telling now Mark Yeager, another Scientology executive, what this private person, celebrity, is saying in their confidential sessions and, and basically just ridiculing them. It wasn't even more of a moral judgment exactly. or an ethical. It was more of a just ridiculing and fodder for David Miscavige. Yeah, rumor mongering, and and also, I mean, Mark Yeager, he's not a case supervisor, he's not a technical person, he's just, you know, guess what's going on. Like that, that would matter, right? Like, there's anybody right. technical in Scientology anyway. Like, I like yeah. how you try to make make a case supervisor, which is just a person who oversees your your confidential sessions, as somebody who is is. Uh, uh, you know, abiding by some moral and ethical code or even uh, the law, uh, well, which they are not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just trying to say that, like, it's like just... they were, like, they were, they, like, they had the credentials to be doing anything in the field of mental health or. Yeah, he's just yeah. flinging, flinging your personal confidential information <laughs> up to anyone, you know, that he sees fit. But anyway, um, yeah, there was a lot of talking about um, celebrities' cases and stuff like that. Um, and also sex lives. David Miscavige he's obsessed is with obsessed with yeah. sex life. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely 100%. And this isn't just celebrities. This is Scientology executives. I mean, anybody who is around in his sort of orbit yeah. is fodder for this constant, constant degrading discussion yeah. about them whether it comes from their, you know, their auditing folders and what they've said, or whether it's just him accusing people of doing things that, that just is made up, right? like, and talking in the most disgusting terms about other people. I mean, he did that the, to the, me it, constantly. I know. Constantly. He, I, I know, Amy. I, I, that, that's sort of why I'm bringing it up. He did it to you. <laughs> that was a wonderful he, target I, of that. He, I mean, women or men, it didn't matter. And who they were and their status in the in the organization or their position, everybody was beneath him, so everybody was fair game. And right. he would make disgusting comments to someone like Amy or other women in CMO International. Like what? You guys oh. would be in a meeting, set it up. You'd be in a meeting... Right, yeah. and Ed there'd Foles. be like twenty or thirty people there, uh -huh. many of whom were junior to mm. Amy. Okay, like they they were subordinates, like mm. maybe way down the organizing chart of mm -hmm. Scientology. Mm -hmm. And and on a whim, he would just look over and say, uh, "Stop gagging on that cock you've been sucking, and wipe the cum off your mouth." Stop it. Oh no, that that's like mild. But he wouldn't just make that <laughs> statement. Then he would go on and on, like you've got this cricket bat up your butt, and you're walking around with your ass in the air, and you're, you know, you're famous now because you got your finger up your ass, you know. And now I'm making you famous across the whole pro. I mean, he would just go on this roll. He was, I mean, this and guy. And no one would dare obsessed. say anything. Men, women, nobody would say, "Sir, enough. It's enough." Right? And no. it's just. For people who are listening, why, why would you not do something like that? Why would you not say this is inappropriate, it's actually illegal? The thought of reporting this type of abuse is not known to Sea Org members and even Scientologists. They would never think this is inappropriate behavior, illegal behavior. Um, and then we all know, uh, if you've seen Going Clear or the aftermath, that the beatings were taking place, this kind of mental abuse, sexual abuse is, is, is just so common in Scientology, but especially in, in David Miscavige's organization. So if you haven't seen Going Clear, you should see that and as well, the aftermath and of which Amy was in season one. And for those who don't know, uh, the series, The Aftermath was inspired by Amy and her mother, uh, Bonnie Elliott, who has passed away. But 
Um, yeah, so please see that, 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 that will be posted on the website, on Mike's blog. But why wouldn't you say anything? Why wouldn't anybody, any of the men there say anything, stick up for you, say that's enough? I mean, you want to answer first, Amy? I, I'll answer why I wouldn't say anything. Oh, I would say, I would say, you know, times are tough, sir, or something stupid like that, just to like kind of acknowledge and maybe hopefully shut him, <laughs> shut right. him up. Um, but like, he's, I mean, he's got his entire entourage there. He's in charge of the entire church Scientology. He tells you all the time that he's going to send you to Timbuktu, you know, or to the re- RP, the, the rehabilitation project force where you'll, where you'll never see your family again, blah, blah, blah. I mean, so many threats have I received that he is capable of doing because you give your life to the sea organization. Like mm-hmm. you, you live there, you eat there, you get uniformed yeah, he's there. Your, he's your primary caretaker. Right. Yes. <laughs> so, and he decides if you get paid or not, if you, if you ever have a day off or a, any sleep at all or not, you know, and so you're not wanting to, you already obviously ruffled his feathers with my, ever, whatever, uh, he thought with I was your doing very existence. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So you just want it to be over. And, and I think Leah, the second thing, I, that's a perfect answer, Amy, you're absolutely correct. But the second thing is the thing that you've brought up many, many times about TRs and bull baiting. Scientologists are supposed to be able to sit there unflinchingly right. at any provocation, mm. anything anybody does or says to you, you're not supposed to react or be at effect of. Right. So you know that if you react in some fashion, it will be treated as a, a sign of weakness. Right that you have reacted because your, quote, TRs are out. Right, and just if I could just explain quickly what that is. Very young age, one of the basic courses that all Scientologists are required to do is called a communications course. And these, these there's a set of drills called training routines, and they teach you how to not react, like Mike is saying. And they're, they're, they're numbered from zero to four, and then later on there's more advanced training routines where you physically are being you know, held in a room, you're not allowed to leave. Um, you get trained to uh, keep somebody in a room uh, and you're physical with them. And um, in these TRs that that all children are taught, all of us are taught, is one, one of the training routines is called bull baiting. And I don't know if you're allowed to put up, Mike, the TRs on your on your blog. Are you allowed to? Absolutely. You should Absolutely. post that, ju- just a training routine yeah. so that people can see it. But there's one called bull bait, which is, you know, basically baiting, right? Baiting the bull. And you have, you are trained to sit there while an adult usually is in front of you as a child saying sexual things to you, putting you down, uh, finding your buttons. The, the purpose of the drill for the coach is to find a button, something that bothers the other person, and then you pound hard on that button until that person no longer reacts to that. So... As a child, I can just tell you, a lot of times I had grown men sitting in front of me and they would talk about my body. They would, some of them would touch my sister and I, and then a supervisor came over at one point and said, oh, you're not allowed to touch them, but you could, uh, you know, approximate touching them. And um, you were taught to not react to any sexual content being thrown at you. You're taught to accept abuse. And then you are to turn around and then do that to the person who did it to you. So then they teach you how to abuse people. And anybody who knows anything about Psychology 101 will tell you, teaching your children or teaching people to react to things is vital. Mm -hmm. Vital. I had to relearn everything after I left. because I'm still learning, Amy. I know. I'm still learning how to be a human. It is totally an ongoing process. You know, David Miscavige also had uh, the Watchdog Committee, and I don't know who else, do two-hour confronts of a picture of him <laughs> pasted on the wall where they so, literally sat <laughs> in, and faced the wall, the picture on the wall and confronted him for two hours straight. So you were basically flat on him is why you didn't react to any of this, I guess, right? Because yeah, maybe yeah. I didn't do that. I didn't do that two-hour thing. Luckily, but well, no, you, you I, I did. had. But, you but, did. But, you did work. <laughs> yeah. I, I had but, plenty but, of him. Believe yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, Mikey. But then Leah, the the 
failure to react then resulted in a whole new thing, which I was the the founding starting member of this, which was called the pie face. Oh. Because you sort of learn that any reaction can result in a negative counter reaction, mm-hmm. no matter what he does. And then no matter what you do or say, it's sort of a trap. You know, you're wrong. If you do this, you're wrong. If you answer that way, you're wrong. If you say yes, sir, you're wrong. If you say no, sir, there's no like way out. So I started sort of looking blankly with my tears in just mm. staring, <laughs> saying nothing. Right. Like no, no reaction, okay, which is what you were taught I'm to do. I'm not reacting. Yeah, that's what you were taught to do. Then we got posters. <laughs> that then became that, oh, what's this now? Pie face. Pie face is he took paper plates and drew a little face on it, like a, a line for the mouth, a line for the nose, and two dots for the eyes, mm-hmm. and said, that people had to hold those up in front of their faces because he'd rather look at the pie face <laughs> than real people's faces. So you would have a table full of the senior most executives of Scientology, the international hierarchy of Scientology, mm-hmm. sitting around a conference table holding paper plates with little faces drawn and on them. And you guys did it. Now, you know, we're laughing about it, but uh, just... Because I, I don't want to answer these questions or th- see these kinds of tweets. You know, well, if it was me, I would have beat the shit out of him. I would have walked out. While I understand your quick uh, response to this, uh, we have no idea what, what it means to be locked um, away in a facility uh, for most of your life, to be in the Sea Org most of your life, to have your primary caretaker be a Sea Org member, with this kind of mentality, this is what they were raised in day in and day out, received abuse day in, day out, neglect from their own families, their Scientology families, day in, day out for most of their lives. And um, you should just look into that, what that creates in a person before you start saying, well, if it was me, I would have just launched across the table and beat the shit out of this little guy. Um, because none of us were there, none of us experienced that kind of abuse for that length of time for most of our lives. Um, and, and I understand it because I'm doing I'm doing the work into finding out how this could happen to people. And um, it should be met with compassion and understanding that they continue to speak out, that Mike continues to do this work, Amy Scobie, and our circle of OGs is admirable because not everybody comes out of a situation of abuse like this and decides to do something about it. Thank you, Leah. You're welcome. No, sincerely, thank you. Because that does come up often and, you know, there's a lot. It's insulting. Yeah, it's insulting. And I know the the reason why. Right. But be informed rather than opinionated. Okay. I was at that property for 20 years, which is fully fenced, guarded, you know, security guards, um, you have to write a petition to your superiors and on up the organization to, to leave the property. Um, you have to go with somebody else off the property as an escort. If you want to make a phone call, I, I never made a phone call off the property without security or somebody else listening in on the call. So you, it it is full time, full blast control. Yeah. Right. And I get it. And I get how hard it is for you guys, and yet you, you've persevered. Uh, it says a lot about your resilience. It says a lot about people in general who deal with this kind of abuse, mental, sexual, physical abuse, who somehow make a life for themselves. Um, it, it really does speak to who you are, that, that, you, that you did it despite what has happened to you. That and is, I, think, I think that's I why some, a lot of the people who left are some of my best closest friends that always will be it it will not matter whatever happens they will be (laughs) yeah no i get it and and we are a tight-knit group all of us like there this is not a group that will say i need you lightly and 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 for the other side to say you're you're good right you know because i'm in the middle of something i'm in the middle of dinner (laughs) uh so you know this is a very um 
very caring and loving too. All right, let's, for a moment, if we may, let's get back to how L. Ron Hubbard became obsessed with celebrity, right? And then, in turn, Dave Miscavige. Mike, you, you printed out these great policies for us here. Right. Um, and Amy, like we said, was, was, was in the Watchdog Committee, which is an organization that Dave Miscavige is what? That's his, again, I mean, there is no organization that's separate from David Miscavige. Right. It's it's the senior it's like the 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 uh the body that oversees all the activities of Scientology around the world. Okay. And there is an individual member of that body responsible for each of the different parts of Scientology. So there's one responsible for the missions, there's one responsible for certain types of Scientology organizations. Amy was responsible for the celebrity centers of Scientology because Hubbard was so obsessed with celebrities uh-huh. that in 1968, he created an organization which still exists today and it's very prominent there on in, in Hollywood uh, called the Celebrity Center. At, at the time, it was just the Celebrity Center. Now it's called Celebrity Center International because that's the the sort of headquarters of Scientology's efforts to reach celebrities around the world. They have celebrity centers in Paris and in Nashville and in New York, or half of them might have been closed down by now. But there is this idea that Hubbard had that we will create an organization that is dedicated to uh, attracting and servicing people who qualify as celebrities. And he gave a definition of what a celebrity is. I'll put that on the website and on my blog. I don't need to read it out. But back in the 50s, Mm -hmm. when Hubbard was trying to get Dianetics and Scientology popularized, he realized that one of the ways to do that was to get prominent, famous people involved and get them to start speaking about their results and successes in Scientology. Mm -hmm. And he published this thing in a magazine at the time called Project Celebrity, Mm -hmm. where he listed out a whole string of celebrities of the time, you know, Walt Disney and Jimmy Stewart and Pablo Picasso and Ernest Hemingway and Bob Hope, a whole bunch of people. And he said, okay, you can write in and say, Allocate this person to me, and you will have full rights to pursue that game, and you can hunt them down. (laughs) Mike, so I have this in front of me, this Project Celebrity that's written by L. Ron Hubbard. Uh, Towards the end, it says, these these celebrities are well-guarded, well-barricaded, overworked, aloof quarry. If you bring one of them home, you will get a small plaque as your reward. (laughs) If you want one of these celebrities as your game, write us at once so the notable will be yours to hunt without interference. Could you imagine? Okay, so that's, and you'll put this on your blog, right, Mike? I will. I will. And I'll put the policy letter that describes what a celebrity is. And But the real thing is that Hubbard's obsession with celebrities actually sort of pales into comparison to David Miscavige's obsession with mm-hmm. celebrities because he became absolutely convinced that the way to accomplish the goals of Scientology and make a cleared planet, et cetera, et cetera, was to get celebrities to actively promote, disseminate, proselytize Scientology. Yes, like I'm successful because of Scientology. I'm only successful because of Scientology will bring in people, right? Like, Correct. You know, some will say, well, listen, Tom Cruise was successful because he was a talented, good-looking, charming guy. Scientology, with or without Scientology, no, listen, Amy, I know you disagree with me. I wouldn't have sex with Tom. He's not my, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is... <laughs> 
but for for Hollywood standards, like he's right, he's a talented guy. He's a good looking guy. He's a charming guy. Um, so he would have made it with or without Scientology. Scientology wasn't the common thread of everybody in Hollywood because there is more. There's like a handful of Scientologists in Hollywood that are successful in comparison to the majority of successful non-Scientologists. So Scientology is not the missing ingredient no. to people's right. successes. But anyway, go ahead, Mikey. But that was the purpose. And that was the purpose of celebrity centers, right? Correct. To, to, make, to make celebrities into walking success stories of Scientology. That's literally the statement. Walking success stories. So that way they, their um, words, their actions would all um, raise Scientology as legitimate. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, okay, so so because L. Ron Hubbard says celebrities are very special people and have a very distinct line of dissemination, right? They have communication lines uh, that others do not have, and many media to get their dissemination through. So that is the purpose, not so much to make them success stories for themselves, for their lives, to better their families, to <laughs> to get themselves out of poverty, to to be no. uh, full rounded human beings, to start to to reach Definitely out not. to the world who, who now that you've made it now, you know, look at doing some work and, you know, volunteering, donating some money, starting a charity of your own, donating to charities. Like, none of that is part of. Not, yeah. not at all. No, right. No, no. Use your influence to bring people in. Into Scientology. Yes. yes. Right. Yes. And, and to some extent, Hubbard is correct. Yeah. I mean, this was not a, an incorrect perception that if you can get celebrities endorsing your shit, yeah. you are going to get more people coming in to try it. Right. And that, that you know, that works in, in selling cars and toilet paper and everything else. Mm -hmm. If you can get people who are recognizable and other, you know, people that someone looks up to, to say, I drive a Lincoln because Lincolns are really cool then you're going to get more Lincoln sold. And that was what Hubbard was trying to accomplish. Sure. Get more Scientology and Dianetics sold. Yes. And that is still what they are trying to accomplish with celebrities. Although these days, the, the enthusiasm for promoting Scientology amongst the celebrities that are left is really uh, waned. <laughs> right. From back in the good old days when Tom Cruise was out talking about Scientology everywhere he went. Now, not even him even utters the word Scientology anywhere these days. Right. Now, how are celebrities treated? Are they these do would you guys say that Amy that you guys treated celebrities differently or what was Oh my goodness. Oh yes. Oh, I mean, you don't get one ounce of internal laundry on their plate without almost like a death sentence. I mean, it's very walk on eggshells. It's we when we did the renovations for the Manor Hotel, they had their private entrance, their secure parking garage, their private course rooms, their private auditing rooms, um, a way to get in and out of the place with no one seeing them. Um, they had only the highest trained um, personnel assigned. To them, when I first took over Celebrity Center in 1990, um, all of the top celebrities that were in Scientology were being directly handled by um, the Religious Technology Center, supervised by COB's office, uh, Shelley Miscavige and David Miscavige. And I had to like literally do an entire series. It's just very complicated, but an entire series of steps to gradually be able to take the reins back over from them um, with training personnel and building the organization and staffing it up and um, all kinds of different things. But um, th that was something that they had their finger on the pulse nonstop all the time. So I was always having to report on the status of celebrities and what was going on. Like who, who was under your, who was under your watchful eye? Um, well, I'll give an example like Isaac Hayes, for example. Um, see, David Miscavige ordered that Isaac Hayes get free service. Um, not only just him, but Edgar Winter as well, and Tom Cruise and Tom Cruise's entourage. Um, basic, well, for 
Isaac, it was because he was having financial difficulty. Okay. And so, you know, he should, they wanted him in the fold and to get as much, you know, auditing and training and become a solid Scientologist because of his influence in the black community. And why was he not uh, fully in the fold? He was new. Okay. He was new. He, he came to Celebrity Center um, to film something. He wasn't a Scientologist. And then um, Alfredi Johnson started disseminating to him. And he started, he did like a purification rundown or whatever. And, um, but d- didn't really know. He was leery. So they wanted him totally in the fold. So, so he got all, you know, free. It was an order from David Miscavige directly. Free service for him. Free service for um Edgar Winter, Tom Cruise. Why this would be alarming to most Scientologists who don't listen to this podcast or watch anything that is telling <laughs> the truth about Scientology, but just so you all know who are listening, why this is such an outrage is the average person in Scientology is not rich. They work day and night to pay for Scientology, live below their means to pay for Scientology. Uh, their children do not get vacations. They do not buy nice things. They do not try to have nice things because they're paying for Scientology. They are required to be there every day, minimum two and a half hours a day as a parishioner, and they work regular jobs to pay for Scientology. They take out loans. They live on credit cards to pay for Scientology, to have one of the richest Scientologist and his family get free Scientology is, by the way, against Scientology policy written by L. Ron Hubbard and just outrageous because I think about these mothers and fathers, people who, like my mother and my stepfather, who have no retirement, they've given all their money to Scientology, they took out loans against the house that I bought for them that they would have been sitting pretty on. Had they not paid for Scientology. And these are people who are today in debt, homeless, because they're paying for Scientology, or they've paid for Scientology, or they have $100,000 sitting on an account somewhere that they don't plan on using. And to hear that Tom Cruise's family and Tom Cruise is getting free Scientology, it just is uh, outrageous. Outrageous. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. (laughs) <laughs> and there was also something about because Tom Cruise gave speakers to David Miscavige, he was getting some free stuff because of that, too. But I mean, Tom Cruise got so much stuff. I mean, I went to his house um, where when I was manning it up and I thought I was the only one that was kind of being used to help him on the side, you know, <laughs> as, a, as a Sea Org member to help him. There was an entire fleet of people um installing his in-home theater, putting in the best sound system imaginable. For free. These For are free. Or, these oh, are totally. Org members who are not getting paid, by the way. So it's not right. even like right. they made money on this system. They this this was this was parishioner money that David Miscavige is using and and, and using labor of the Sea Org. You're not even supposed to be in a celebrity you're not even allowed to have lunch with not even a celebrity, but a parishioner as Sea Org members. You're not supposed to be fraternizing, intermingling fraternizing with us. And yet there you are uh, manning up Tom Cruise's house, which, by the way, I got in trouble for when I asked when I saw Tom Davis, a Sea Org member who worked for David Scavage. I said, why are you here? This doesn't make any sense why you'd be in this man's house. Like, because I was yeah, good point. raised to believe you don't fraternize. Yeah. Sea Org members, that's like, what's a good analogy to make, Mike? Like, that is like the Pope priest be hanging out in my kitchen, like just hanging out, just here to help Lee in case she needs a burger. That it's, a, it's so degrading to even a Sea Org position. Am I crazy in thinking this? No, 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 no. No. One of the people that were there also, um, which really surprised me, was there's there's what's called a household unit um, at the um, international headquarters that was responsible for only L. Ron Hubbard's personal effects. Clothes. Clothes and, uh-huh. and, and house and, and, and keeping that up. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> don't, I don't want anybody to get the idea that this was happening when he was alive, Amy. 
Oh, no, no, no. He was long gone. It's still <laughs> happening, everybody. Sea Org members are still putting out L. Ron Hubbard's pajamas every <laughs> night just in case he comes back. Okay, and, and this person was the person who worked in the household unit for L. Ron Hubbard that did his pajamas. And so, you know, and we think, okay, that's kind of like sacred, right? Well, that person was at Tom Cruise's house doing his laundry. And so, to me, it threw me for a loop. Jenny Gaynor, I think her last name was. Uh, it threw me for a yes. total total loop because, well, I knew I was supposed to be finding somebody who was going to be doing the laundry. So, I guess I'm supposed to replace her <laughs> as a Sea Org member so she can get back to her real duty serving dead L. Ron Hubbard. <laughs> right, right, right. So, let's get back to... Uh... To, to the celebrity portion of this. So you were in charge of, um, what? say the name again, I just went blank. Oh, I, well, I was just, I was responsible for the entirety of Celebrity Center. The president's office I ran on um, cele celebrity recovery. Okay. Um, and celebrity recruitment. Okay. And, um, and then dealing with the existing celebrities. So those three facets. And how would you guys go about recruiting new celebrities? Um, using existing. Using existing celebrities. So That's saying, right. give us some names, uh, you know, who do you oh, want yeah. to bring in? Yes. They would have, each celebrity would be sat down because they know people. So mm -hmm. they would be sat down and who are your friends? Who are your contacts? Who do they know? How, mm -hmm. what, how can you get in on these you know, um, different parties or whatever that where you can actually befriend the person and then you would work out a strategy. And who have you guys gotten in like this? Um, you know, one of the people that we were really working on at the time was Brad Pitt, but that didn't end up working out. But Juliette Lewis was um, assigned, you know, to get him in. There was another big recruitment project, which was for Joe Montana. He was the 49ers quarterback. And that one was being handled directly by uh, Greg Wilhair in, in RTC. But that was something that, you know, was, we also got Tom Berenger in, and that was completely messed up. It was a big, big flap. <laughs> I got in trouble for that one um, because he was, he was gotten in and he, um, he started on the uh, course in the, but the course supervisor wouldn't let him smoke a cigarette when he wanted to smoke. And so he walked out and never came back. Right. Cause you're not allowed to just get up and leave even as, oh, a, no. as a parishioner, but you, oh, no. you know, what's funny is that you guys say things like, you know, celebrities are treated very differently. And I could just tell you it, it didn't feel that way. It only felt that, right? that way. It only felt that way when it came to Tom, um, because there was Tom and then the rest of us. Right. And even though I had a private entrance to go in, you know, they wouldn't lock down the private entrance when I was there, but they would lock it down when Tom was there. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Like they wouldn't really? lock down Actually, the elevators. I, like I had that. to wait like a normal person. Whereas Tom, they were like, that ah, can't go, get a walk. Okay. But I got to go to the ninth floor. Well, start fucking Take walking. The okay. okay. <laughs> to the ninth floor. <laughs> got it. You know, and we all uh, uh, understood, right? It was all because he's a bigger star. And my mentality uh, was that he was helping to help clear the planet. And he was promoting Scientology. And he was doing amazing things. And he was doing it in a way that I couldn't, right? And wasn't. But there, it was it, when it came to Tom, it was very different. Because you couldn't even say I didn't even like a movie of Tom's without right. being interrogated and punished by your church. So it didn't feel, Amy, that we had any special treatment, it, you know, because we were punished severely being around him. Just wow. being around him and having a bad thought about him was I actually didn't realize punishable. that. Yes, yes. He started me on the path of leaving, of seeing the hypocrisy of, of Scientology the lies of Scientology, Shelly not being at the wedding, Shelly going missing. It took me six years to actually exit, but he it was because of knowing him that it start me on this path of questioning. Well, what God am I bless doing? Bless him here? for doing that then. <laughs> right? I know. <laughs> oh my word. <laughs> In a way I owe him a lot. I I feel that I owe it to him for him to try to help him get out and right. get his life back. Um, anyway, that's again yeah. another time for another. Sure. Well, I th I think that the other thing that that is 
like there is a lot more that we could talk about about the things that were done for him, mm-hmm. you know, the his hangar and yeah. the limos that were built for him and the wedding to Nicole and all the Sea Org members that flew to Telluride and did the cooking and like this was this was sort of the routine when it came to Tom Cruise. Mm-hmm. But it sort of goes also that when Tom Cruise wanted something and he said to his buddy, David Miscavige, you know, I want X, Y, and Z, Mm -hmm. then David Miscavige would, unlike anything else, would bend over backwards to make that happen, Mm -hmm. whatever it was. And when time came for Nicole and Tom's uh, split, we all know that Marty Rathbun has talked extensively and written extensively about his involvement in hiring PIs to tap her phones. And Marty Rathbun at that time was David Miscavige's right-hand man. Right. So the, and to turn the kids against her because she was a suppressive person. Yeah, that, that's for sure. It's very different. It's not, it's not like, oh, they're trying to settle, make things easier to leave and not long divorces and all that. No, this is to protect Tom Cruise, but more importantly, Scientology. Right. Yeah. And and to keep him indebted to David mm-hmm. Miscavige. Right. Because right. that's also a part of it, is that he, you know, at a time, at some point in that history of the relationship between Tom and Nicole, mm-hmm. they were off in England shooting Eyes Wide Shut with Stanley Kubrick on a closed set for a year. Mm-hmm. And... Tom Cruise was drifting away from Scientology and David Miscavige was in a panic about it. Right. And he was worried that Tom wasn't returning his calls, that Nicole was influencing him to get him away from Scientology because Nicole, her father is a psychiatrist. So obviously she's a bad person and only was allowed in Scientology because she was married to Tom Cruise. Like, under normal circumstances, no, but why was she allowed she would to not be, be eligible? Yo, f- completely right. Would not be eligible to even be in Scientology if you had a family member intimately connected to you that was a psych. That's like right. the worst type of person ever. But how was Correct. she able? Why did they facilitate him being with Nicole when they knew that in the beginning? Because in the beginning, it was before Miscavige had really established his guruhood over uh, Tom see. Cruise. I gotcha. It was him trying to get to the point where Tom Cruise felt indebted to him. Got gotcha. you. That it was like relatively early on. There was mm-hmm. a lot of water under the bridge after that fact. And I think that if Tom Cruise had now decided, you know, in later years that he wanted to take up with a woman whose father was a psychiatrist, he would have been told no right. by David And he would have listened. And he would have listened. He would have listened. Yes. And then David Miscavige would have gone and found him another woman. Um, I want to ask you guys a question about Laura Prepon, who has recently left the Church of Scientology. Now, she claims that she had left five years earlier, and she's just been living her life. What, what are your thoughts on this, Amy, Mike? Because also Beck left, Jason Lee left. These were very public Scientologists, but who are not public uh, non-Scientologists. Right. I think they they're probably just quietly leaving without saying anything seeing what happens when when people do speak out Leah mm-hmm. <laughs> like you. Yeah. <laughs> um getting attacked left right and center so you know let some water go under the bridge get some distance and then maybe slightly state it because it is more popular to not be a Scientologist than it is to be a Scientologist. Now, I have a question for you. You guys, I just need you to be completely honest. So I recently did an interview where somebody asked me about it. And I said, you know, I listen. they said, how do you feel about Laura not speaking out? Not, you know, whatever. And I said, I don't really respect it. Now, I've gotten like two or three people going, that's fucked up. Why would you say that? Everybody has a right to live their lives the way, who the fuck are you to make a comment like that? What are your thoughts? Do you think you think that was not nice, Mike, Amy? Well, Amy's no, the nicer. Was... Hang on, a- actually, Amy's nicer okay. than us. Mike, don't answer that. No, Amy, <laughs> Amy, was that wrong of me? Just be honest. Okay, this is my honest view. Please tell me. You should have stuck it right to her because that is complete <laughs> horseshit. 
Whoa, why? I'm sorry. I'm sorry for swearing. But why, Amy, her. what do you say to the people who say, listen, she has a right to live her life and not be as outspoken as you? Celebrities use their celebrity to make Scientology, quote unquote, normal, okay, and safe for people to come into. It is a destructive cult. Whatever she's seen, she needs to make known. Whatever she knows and has experienced, she needs to make known. I have no respect for people who have left the C organization, especially those who were um, at the highest levels that experienced and were um, receiving the severe, severe abuse, right. um, saying nothing and hiding out and keep covering their, their care, covering their ass. I got nothing for speaking out. Like it, it, it was a, a pain in the butt, you know, uh, and they smeared me like crazy and there's and they a continue lot. continue to do so. Of course. And, you know, and I, but I decided I am going to cross that line and go ahead and speak truth because to me, that is more important and it'll help other people from not getting involved in such a scuzzy criminal organization. And they mm -hmm. need to know what actually is going on. So if she knows something and then she just doesn't want to say anything and keep let years go by, you know, whatever, I don't have respect for that either. Well, she, she did publicly say that she has left. But, but let me, let me just say something about, about Laura. I, it's not that I don't understand yeah. the desire to not have the, the boogeyman at her front door and yeah. that she wants to raise her family, et cetera, et cetera. But at the very least, what she could have done, mm -hmm. if she doesn't want to go into an all-out blitz, is simply say, based on my experience, I don't want anybody to get the idea that I think it's a good idea for them to get involved in Scientology. Mm -hmm. Like at least a statement like that, because yeah. as you said, Leah, and as Amy said, her stardom and, and, and truthfully, if it's true that it was the five years, mm -hmm. then when she became really uh, an international star in Orange is the New Black, mm -hmm. that was within the last five years. Mm -hmm. And she was being touted and promoted and known as a Scientologist. Mm -hmm. And Scientology was talking about her as a Scientologist. Mm -hmm. And if you look in celebrity mags, she'll you'll see her in there. And that she hmm. granted interviews for and yeah. Right. I think that's the difference is that, you know, she was a public Scientologist like I was, promoted Scientology. And so we felt a responsibility, all of us, to do something about it um, uh, when we left. And right. yes, it is a personal choice. I get it. Maybe I didn't need to say that publicly. Probably shouldn't have said that publicly because I don't want uh, people to, to think that I'm insensitive to people who don't have the courage to speak out. I get it. You certainly have the right to decide what's right for you. Um, I decided what was right for me. One is not better than the other, although there is that caveat. There is that added element of you were not a, um, you weren't a civilian. You were a public professional Scientologist making commission on getting people into Scientology. That's right. Influencing. You're influencing the populace toward Scientology. So just take responsibility that there's no responsibility, just a silent kind of exit. You're just leaving a big vacuum. What, what about these people that you influenced? I, I believe it was more of recent. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I knew regardless if that you did the right thing was a hard thing to leave. Right. So I reached out to Chelsea and said, Hey, can you send this to Laura? And in that text, it said, Hey honey, I don't know if this is exactly true, but if it is, know that I am here for you. If you want to talk, don't go. I'm not wanting you to go public with it. I won't even tell anybody we spoke. Chelsea sends that to her, gets back a message. Hey, Chica, but kids are great. ba ba da ba be ba da boo Want to talk to you about my whatever the fuck. Love you. And maybe she had to sign things. I don't know what they're doing with these people now. But but she has no reason to subscribe to any of it. No. Zero. No, she absolutely does not have to. But it's really a stupid mind thing that they, you know, sometimes it takes people a little while for it to 
to shake off, but um, but Amy, if it's been five fucking years, you would think yeah, she that's could what I don't believe it. Text. I, By the way, I didn't <laughs> even go directly to her, which I could have. I went through a mutual friend, a via text, <laughs> out of fucking respect. No, she's she's still totally be under their control. Right. Yeah. What are your yeah. thoughts, Mike? Oh, I I agree with both of you. I, I'm not sure that that control is in the form of a legal document or any particular threat. It's mind. Mm -hmm. Like, at the very least, still in the same mindset. Mm -hmm. And that would indicate that it has not been five years For that she's sure. been away. Yes. So, Mike, you were talking about the celebrity project and, and how it, it was, you know, went from... L. Ron Hubbard over into it's always been a strategy of Scientology to bring in celebrities, um, and and because it's the purpose of Scientology, they are supposed to salvage the entirety of mankind. So you have to reach the entire population. You need people who are on the world stage in order to say Scientology is a wonderful thing. If you expect at all to make any sort of impact on the planet, so um, getting a big fish like Tom Cruise or John Travolta to say. You know, I'm a Scientologist, I'm proud of it, and you should be a Scientologist too because it's helped me become successful, even though it probably wasn't the, the thing that actually did it. But yeah. um, that would drive in people into the different organizations. So it's it's always been part of the strategy for Scientology expansion. And then a whole um, division of Scientology was devoted toward the caring procuring them, taking care of them, and expanding the ranks of the celebrities. And um, and they were monitored very closely. I had a few flaps in that regard, too, which um, I remember one time, uh, Karen Hollander, who is the president of um, Celebrity Center, I recruited Susan, Susan uh, Watson, who's the current president. But when Karen Hollander was the president, she was up at the international base with me, and we were planning um, a handling for a celebrity that had fallen off the rails. They were videotaping homosexual activities. And this was a big flap because they were very uh, well known. And if that got released or known or gotten out or somehow leaked or something like that, it was it would be devastating for Scientology. We weren't even talking about for that person necessarily, but the ramifications of what that would cause for Scientology. And so um, we had all the files with all the information, and then we drove back down to L.A., and um, we had it in a briefcase and put it in the locked security area of the president's office. Then Tom Davis came home at 2 o'clock in the morning, decided to take the vehicle that it was in, drive to the Wilcox <laughs> in L.A., and then take the briefcase out and put it into the trunk, which someone who was sitting on a roof saw. When he went in to, to go to sleep that night, they came down and broke into the vehicle and stole. To prove something to him? And No, and stole uh, this, uh, just a, a street person came oh, and saw oh, him put something in the trunk, and so they stole it. And um, it had all of the ethics information, all of the PC, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, counseling, confessional information, everything in these files, in this briefcase, stolen by a homeless person in Hollywood. Okay, this was such a flap. I mean, Religious Technology Center was on the line, you know, like everyone monitoring me. We had to search the entirety of Hollywood. We went through every single dumpster, you know, offered rewards, this, that, and the other thing. And every single day I was down there and having to report to um, Mike Sutter on the status of this thing. Well, it blows me away, but we did find it because, no. be yes, we did find it like two weeks later. Where was um, it? It was in this old lady's house because the person who took it, took it up onto the roof. Somebody else stole it from him and then brought it down into his, you know, aunt's little apartment in the back of and saying, you know, um, her word on the street is somebody's looking for this. So it could be valuable, like that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. And and also, you know, kind of ripped through it, but couldn't understand like the the what what it was really. And um, so, but then word on the street was that there was a reward. So um, somebody came to the celebrity center with this thing and said, "This must be some real important stuff." They got a twenty dollar bill. 
but they no. were really, <laughs> yeah, they were really happy uh, uh, about that. But um, yeah, we finally found it. But every single dumpster in Hollywood, people on the street were, you know, ass- uh, assigned to try to find this thing. We finally, finally found it. But it was a, it, it would have been a very big uh, PR flap for Scientology. Now, why would it have been a PR problem for Scientology? Because this was sci- this, this was about a, wait. I just want to be clear. This mm-hmm. was about a Scientologist a- engaging in sex. I'm assuming it was a man on with a man, and then yeah. and then they were videotaping this. That's right. And then, how did you guys find out about it? Did he he confess and this in one of his Scientology it. sessions, That's and then right. he handed over the videotape? No, he still had the videotape. We just knew that the videotape was was out there and could have been, you know, uh, found or discovered or whatever. So we were trying to make a plan of how we were going to get this thing, how we were going to get him handled, how we were going to somehow get this situation. Under because control. Scientology sees that this would be this the worst thing ever to know that two men could possibly be having sex. Someone or having who, a relationship or who was yeah. was promoting himself as a Scientologist at that even time, you know, because it was like on a world stage type of thing, promoting himself as a Scientologist. And it wasn't just with another man, it was a group of men or something like this. Oh, and it I was see. all okay. all videoed. And you don't do that for the ethics standards of Scientology. Sure. Uh, right, because the ethical the ethical standard of Scientology is very, very high. It's super know. high. Super yeah, yeah, high. Yeah, yeah. No, but but really the point was, uh, Amy, is that the Scientology uh, allows all of this to go on. I mean they, they allow much worse to uh, to go on, right? They just don't want it to get out that anybody's doing that because they're promoting themselves as this ethical. Holier than ethical. now. Yeah, yeah. But but they allow all of this to go on, by the way. Like, why wouldn't Amy write a book about all of this, like one day, all that she knew? I mean, uh, she could. And, you know, it would be up to the legal department or whoever she gets to vet the book to determine whether what is said there could be is, substantiated and proven. Is, it, Right? Yes, and mm-hmm. is damaging to the reputation of the person and is based on information that she uh, received in circumstances that the person thought was going to be protected. Well, if your religion says that homosexuality is one of the worst things type of people band that you can be in and that this band of person... Uh, should be shipped off to an island and basically eradicated off the face of the earth, and yet you're running around being who you truly are, by the way, which I, you know, you get my stamp of approval one million percent, but you're running around um, saying that you're the epitome of this, you're the epitome of that, and you're getting people to buy, literally and figuratively, Scientology based on what you say you believe in, but what you say you believe in is is not only against it, but believes that you should be not even living. I mean... Yeah, it's considered the lepers of, you know, of society. Uh-huh. And right. so and so for that to leak, it would, it would mean that not only do we have no control over our public spokespeople <laughs> in Scientology, um, but that they don't actually believe in the tenets of Scientology, which is actually the case. Right. Right. And yeah. and that's why it's a, a flap organizationally. Right. Rather than the problem being the person themselves. Right. The person themselves, whoever took the video, they were fine with taking the video. They may they may not want it to be public. They didn't give a shit about taking the video or right. having having those sort of relationships. So the issue was and always will be. Is Scientology somehow going to look bad? Or is that person going to be forced to renounce their participation in mm-hmm. Scientology? Yeah. Right. Because that's ultimately what would happen yeah, that's if what that we were sort planning. of stuff got out. That the person would have to say, look, you know, I am who I am and, you know, you judge me how you want. But he couldn't then say, and I'm a good Scientologist mm-hmm. because... That's not acceptable in Scientology. Oh, well, some so, could say that he felt he felt bad and he was giving up his sins and his transgressions and, you know, got right with his marriage and, and gave up his sins to his, his wife or 
and and got on the right course of of you know, listen because if you don't want to be married, don't be married, right? You you don't want to be one one don't. one could say that, but but the the issue is always how does the organization perceive these right, things, right. and mm-hmm. what is the organization's downside, and how is the organization going to be affected? And in in the case of Celebrity Center, it is always. Are we going to lose this person as a effective mouthpiece for Scientology? Yes. And that's what the the worry is, the the process, the, the, the goal is to cover it. Yes, up, yes. All about that. And 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 I want people to know who are struggling artists that that might encounter Scientology and 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 a celebrity center. You know, it, it, I sold it. I understand there. It's intoxicating. You you could be a struggling actor and walk into a celebrity center, be treated like a king and a queen, and mm-hmm. you know you're told that everybody who doesn't believe in you is shit. You know, including your family, and nobody believes in you but us. And you know, it, it feels good to be part of a group. Uh, I'm telling you, um, y- you might not be a name today, but hopefully, you'll be a name in a in a month or two, or a year, or two years. And everything that you have ever said. Uh, are in those folders they will use against you and your life will be destroyed. You will be out of harmony with the town that you claim you want to work in and love. You will, you will not know anybody other than Scientologists. You will not believe in anything. Although you go in being a Christian or a Catholic or Muslim, you will not leave being any of those things. You will be made to give up your religion, give up your family, give up your friends um, and, and I, I look at it now as selling your soul to the devil because you're getting some validation and getting jerked off by people who really do mean you harm, uh, in the beginning it's love bombing. It's, it's classic cult recruiting and they will use and have something over you that you cannot, or feel that you cannot live your life the way you want to live it. You will be yeah. so utterly brainwashed that you will believe you have no way out. I mean, it's the first thing you do, like when when a celebrity comes in or a wannabe celebrity or whatever is, you, first you you have these little um, uh, intros of like how to use the tone scale or whatever and little acting classes and stuff like that to kind of get these people. I know, I did and, them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, and then, you know, right away, you got to find their ruin because then you've got a little folder started. And you're going to know what areas they feel weak in, you know, what, who they're having trouble with, you know, and how, and all these different things. And you just create a file and that file gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And so you have leverage if they ever want to break, break free, just like they did with us. Right. And you guys did that and you did that yourself, Amy, right? You had leverage on people and you would, what was... I know that uh, uh, Tom Davis did that. I don't know who that was with, Mike, when when Tom's uh, former publicist was leaving. Uh, there was a whole campaign done on her that they had a folder on her, and they told her if she ever spoke that they would fucking destroy her career. You know, this is what they do. Yep. Pat Kingsley. Pat Kingsley. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember, Mike, <laughs> you'll probably remember this. This is one of the biggest flaps that ever occurred in – at Celebrity Center, which was in uh, Christmas of 1993. They had this Christmas show and five celebrities were served with subpoenas for the Fishman case. Yes. Okay. So that was a huge flap because these people got into and on the premises of um, Celebrity Center and then served five um, celebrities, including Kelly Preston, Julia Lewis, and Isaac Hayes and some others with subpoenas for a court case against Scientology, which you never want celebrities to know that anyone is suing Scientology. You don't ever want them to know any dirty laundry whatsoever, Mm -hmm. let alone now they're served with subpoenas. So on my end, um, I was immediately instructed that I had to hire um, professional security that worked at Celebrity Center full time. So like like ex secret service. So that's what I did is I hired um, professionals that um, were not only there full-time, but also worked on training the the beefed-up security force of Celebrity Center so that uh, no one could ever reach these guys if they came in on the prompt. Well, that's not a bad thing. I could use that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yeah, but um, the biggest, the reason why it was a flap, though, is because anything about, you know, think any dirty laundry about Scientology or anything like that can never make it to a celebrity. That's just right. Well, mostly, mostly, uh, and, and people should know because they're like, well, the celebrities are in the outside world, but you know, we're all told before something hits the news that we might see uh, that this was a, this is a liar, this is a bigot, this is a religious bigot, this is a suppressive person. They were beating their children, their wives in Scientology. Not to be believed, not to be listened to. Don't read the newspapers. Don't look at People magazine. Don't this. Don't, I mean, at Tom Cruise's wedding, they did a whole sweep on the plane just in case there was anything on the plane about Tom Cruise or Scientology. They try to take our magazines away. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God I was with Jennifer Lopez, who wasn't having it. She was like, fuck you. You're not taking my fucking Us Weekly and my People magazine. Like, 20-hour <laughs> flight. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> but if it was me, they would have taken it. Yep. True. I mean, it, it's, it's so weird. Like, I don't know. It was in the early 80s that they took away televisions from anybody who was in the C organization. So we didn't have any televisions. We didn't get People magazine or us, you know, we didn't have magazines, TV. I didn't know any. So when I became, went on to uh, becoming a WDC for Celebrity Center as a watchdog committee. You knew nobody. I didn't know anyone. <laughs> I mean, I'm supposed to make this list. I'm supposed to make a list of who I wanted, you know, and my, my entire list was, I, I don't even remember, probably Al Pacino or something like, right, right, you know, right. Clint Eastwood from my childhood, you know, right, right, right. but like I, it was really hard, you know, because I hadn't seen any movie or any TV show or anything. I didn't see King of Queens until I left the Sea York. Of course not. I know because, <laughs> and by the way, that hasn't changed. You know, no Sea Org member has a television. Their no. phones do not go to the internet. They're not allowed to have free access to anything that they want to see. Uh, not allowed to have, Kindles, not allowed to have any, like none of that, none of that. Yeah. And, and, and Scientologists right. are told not to go on the internet. We're interrogated if we did, if we did go on the internet, did we click on anything? Are we clicking on anything on our phones? You know, yeah. some Scientologists and even some celebrities, uh, children, their their phones and, and computers are checked by security, by Sea Org security to make sure that they're not, they've blocked anything, you know, quote, unquote, anti-Scientology, but I hate to say that. It's the truth about Scientology. Yeah, the truth. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, it's a very, uh, a, a celebrities are very, um, if, if, if Scientologists are kept out of the loop, c celebrities are very much protected in that what you're saying, Amy, they try to hire, like all of my staff started to become Scientologists. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were trying to fire um, my business manager, who was who was a Scientologist, by the way, who said I shouldn't donate a million dollars to the IAS. Oh, enemy! Yeah, yeah. He was he was actually they wanted to call him in to be security checked, and he said no, that he wouldn't submit to soap checking. I, I highly doubt that he's actually a Scientologist to this day. But um, right. all of the people and were, in my world were becoming Scientologists, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and yeah. that is what's that... going to happen to to mostly every celebrity. If it hasn't already. If, if not already. Yeah. And, and go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, um, when we were doing, you know, I was like, make up the list of the people that we need to target to get into Scientology. Uh, I was working on that with uh, Karen Hollander in the president's office. And I was at the international base and she was in Los Angeles. And so we were having, um, it's like the internal email system. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't go on the internet, but it goes on our internal email well, our communications about who it is that was on our wish list somehow got to the media. And it was, uh -huh. a, it was a gigantic flap. Somehow it was leaked. Right. And, um, and so every celebrity we had to come up with a nickname for. So we couldn't say their name anymore. So like, you know, Isaac Hayes, Hayes was A, you know, and this person was just different things. And we had to come up with different names because... We were being listened in on, and they did this entire thing to search out who was the a plant, you know, the suspected. Did you find in, it? Infiltrator. Was. You know, Mike, maybe you know more about that. I I think they did find who broke through the system, but I don't know. Were you there at the time? Uh, I don't remember when this was, Amy. I know there was a famous guy that was in Incom who started leaking materials out yes. onto the fledgling internet. Yes, that was because that was, he yeah. had access to them in Incom. 
Now, how is yeah. income still the system that they use for their internal stuff? You don't know. Yeah. I have no idea. No, because I mean, when you were is- in the Sea Org, Mike, I mean, your BlackBerry, all your texts and stuff, like, you, you know, that was easily gotten and you could, right? I mean, you guys were, you weren't on like special device. You were on your regular phones, right? At a certain point, you, you know, somebody could subpoena those records. It's not like. Correct. Yeah. 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 By the, you know, later on in time. Mm. But the reason we had Blackberries was because Blackberries were encrypted. Mm. I see. Like there was a, 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 a proprietary system of communication that you could only do from BlackBerry to BlackBerry. Mm. So we had, I had a BlackBerry, Miscavige had a BlackBerry, Marty Rathbun had a BlackBerry, and we would communicate on those. Right. And those supp- supposedly were very secure. Yeah. And it was only a few people that even got to have the Blackberry, so I didn't even get one. <laughs> we were like, you, you kept on to the organization's channels alone, you know? Yes. You were the head of that celebrity was centers. The case. Yes. Right, right, right. Well, Amy, thank you so much um, yeah. for, for coming on once again, for answering the call to us. Yes, and uh, I hope that you're, you're doing great there in Florida. I know you started a new business. Yes. What's the website? That's right. It's lifecelebration.com. Life with a dash celebration.com. Now, why did you start this? Um, after I did my mom's funeral service, I, I did it. Um, and I, I really made sure that her life was celebrated. Um, I felt so like everybody's life needs to be celebrated. I feel like everybody is unique. Everyone has a story and their lives need to be celebrated. So I've now done hundreds of funeral services, and and um, I meet with the families. I find out all about their loved ones. I um, write a beautiful, beautiful tribute, and then I deliver the service with unique gifts and things like that that really celebrate the person. And it just is fulfilling. I feel like it celebrates the people that have gone on to heaven, and I feel like it gives healing to the people left behind. Which is so beautiful, Amy, and so uh, not what you were raised in. You know, we're, we no. were taught, like— why would you go to a funeral? The person's fucking dead. Literally, these are the words that would be said to us if we lost somebody that we love. Like, they're already on to their next life. They're already being born into another body, idiot. Like, why are mm-hmm. you sitting here crying? It is so anti what you were raised in, Amy, anti- and knew compassion. your whole life. That the beautiful person you are is still intact is just amazing. You are just one of the kindest people that I've ever known, Amy, and I, wow. uh, they couldn't ask for a better person to, for their loved ones to be in the hands of, uh, to celebrate their life. And God bless wow. you. God bless thank you, Matt. Thank you. And I, I hope you're happy out there in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I'm by a lot of friends now. So Even though I yeah. miss you, you know, I Amy, know. <laughs> with, Amy lived like two miles from me for a very brief time. I was very excited to have her, but you get to have her for a little while, Mike, and I hope that they'll make their way back to the West Coast. <laughs> yeah. Nope, not happening. <laughs> not happening. Maybe I'll buy something in Florida then. <laughs> yes. Okay. Because that's, that's where you all are. <laughs> At least like we, a we, snowbird type of situation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, Mikey? Oh, we, mm-hmm. we need to open the ice cream parlor in downtown. Clearwater. I'm open. I'm open to opening up anything. I'd like to buy a condo in Tom Cruise's building. <laughs> there you go, <laughs> Mike. What the fuck would they do if I actually lived in the building? Probably they wouldn't clear let you. out. They wouldn't right? let you go in there. They would. They leave. would all leave. Yep. But could you just imagine me walking down Fort Harrison Boulevard, just like getting my coffee, <laughs> saying hi to? <laughs> what would they do? Run away, Leah, run away, <laughs> like they do when we show up down there. It's just, they run away. They go hide. hide. They hide. Also, will you put a link up to Amy's book that she wrote? Uh, yes, yes. Thank of you. Of course. All right, you guys. Thank you so much, Amy. We love you. Love you, too. I miss Amy. you guys. Miss you. <laughs> well, you just got to see Mike. You miss me, you mean. Well, I still miss him. <laughs> <laughs> <You're> so- <laughs> All right, you guys. Well, I love you. Okay. All right. And thanks for listening. Until next time. Bye, guys. Bye, ladies.